Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, so we're going to move from the depths of the sea to the depths of space, if that's all right. Uh, okay, cool. Good. And uh, I'm going to do two things today. Uh, one is I'd like to finish up our discussion on the formation of giant planets by uh, giving you um, one possible uh, way to test whether the core accretion model for the formation of Jupiter and Saturn is really relevant. Remember that yesterday we talked about two possible models for giant planet formation, uh, one involving uh, disk instability, which happens very, very quickly, uh, within 10 to the 4 years, less. And the other is core accretion, which can occur very quickly uh, if needed, if you worry that migration may disrupt the bodies you're making. But um, for perhaps a more realistic distribution of planetesimals could take as long as several million years. So one possible indication that Saturn really did take a few million years to form comes from one of its moons. This is the moon Iapetus. Now Saturn has many moons. It has over 60 natural satellites. Iapetus is uh, one of the so-called intermediate sized satellites and it is um, about 700 kilometers in radius. It's not as large as the largest satellite of Saturn, which is Titan. Uh, it was made famous, uh, if you read the first in the 2001 series, 2001 A Space Odyssey, because in fact, in, in the novel 2001, uh, Bowman ends up going through the Stargate, not in the Jupiter system, but in the Saturn system. And Iapetus turns out to be uh, actually artificially hollowed out uh, and is the place where he, en he enters the Stargate. Um, I can see there are a lot of science fiction fans here, so we'll pass quickly on from that. But, um, <clears throat> and actually later if somebody can tell me this is a piece of trivia as to why Stanley Kubrick changed the venue of the climax of 2001 from uh, Saturn to Jupiter, I'll buy you a beer. So, um, and a uh, discount beer. But uh, anyway, Iapetus is black on one side and it's white on the other side. Uh, that's another story which need not concern us here. It has to do with organic material that's been deposited on the surface of, uh, of Iapetus. But the interesting thing about this moon, which was discovered by Cassini, is that it's actually not uh, round. Um, it's not a sphere. It's actually quite oblate. And in fact, it's um, oblate uh, at a level that is significant. This is the um, plot of two of the <coughs> moments of inertia, the polar and one of the equatorial, um, uh, uh, essentially, axes of this body. Uh, this is um, uh, the, um, uh, let's see, which one is smaller here, 740, 750. So this is the polar one, this is the uh, equatorial one versus rotation period uh, in hours, uh, what's actually measured, the measured difference is given by this faint gray square that you might be able to see on the main screen. And this figure actually matches the figure of a body that is in hydrostatic equilibrium but rotating at 17 hours. Now, in fact, the period of rotation of Iapetus, the period of its spin, is not 17 hours. It's 79 days, which is quite a big difference. So what's going on here? Well, one possibility is that Iapetus is just completely frozen solid and has a kind of an oddball shape. But in fact, it's large enough that um, one can uh, argue, at least, that that kind of extreme non-hydrostaticity has to come from somewhere. It has to start somewhere. You can't simply start with a squished object during formation because during formation it would uh, get, uh, during accretion it would get kind of warm, it would soften up a bit. So how did it actually get to this shape? Well one possibility is that it was in fact originally orbiting uh, with a 17 hour period and it slowed down uh, to 79 hours. Now how would it slow from 17 hours to 79, excuse me, 79 days, not 79 hours? 
Uh, well, the simplest way to do this is by tidal dissipation. The fact that uh, Saturn has a, uh, a, 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 a exerts a gravitational force on Iapetus that's not the same on the near side as it is on the far side. If the interior is dissipative enough, then uh, one can uh, essentially break the rapid rotation of the satellite through this tidal force. And um, that is a possibility, but it requires that the satellite have a sufficiently high dissipation in its interior uh, for those tidal forces to manifest themselves as dissipative forces. <clears throat> so in other words, a completely crystalline block of rock, let's say, uh, is not going to slow down at Iapetus's distance from Saturn in the age of the solar system. If it started out at 17 hours rotation rate, it would finish today at 17 hours rotation rate. So the interior has to have been soft during this process. However, if the interior was too soft, of course, then the shape of Iapetus itself, which is basically oblate, would, of course, relax as the rotation slowed. So you would see an equilibrium figure uh, corresponding to a slower rotator. So what is the solution to all this? Well, Julie Castillo Roger at JPL um, and a group of other authors, including myself, looked at uh, thermal histories for Iapetus. Now, Iapetus is a body that's partly rock and partly ice. That's very typical of the Saturn system. And uh, there are three sources of energy for bodies like this. Uh, one is, of course, accretion. The Virial theorem tells us, uh, as I mentioned briefly yesterday, that uh, if you have material that's spread out over a large area and you bring it together in the form of a self-gravitating sphere, uh, then that potential energy is converted to kinetic energy that kinetic energy manifests itself mostly as heat uh, and the interior is heated up. Tidal forces can also be important but not so much in the case of Iapetus. The orbit is not eccentric enough for tidal heating to be important even though tides can slow the rotation. But there are two other sources that we must not forget because they're important also potentially for other bodies in the solar system. One is long-lived radioactivities, that is the radioactive isotopes of uranium, thorium, and potassium, which are in large measure responsible for the beautiful uh, flora and fauna and environment, I should say, the environment of those fauna that you saw in John's wonderful movies. Uh, in fact, the Earth's crust contains um, a large, larger than average fraction of those elements because of the chemical separation of the mantle and the crust over time. Those radioactive isotopes decay slowly over billions of years to stable isotopes and as they decay they generate heat. Now it turns out that if you um, look at a model of the interior of Iapetus in which you um, accrete the body and you put in um, essentially uh, the amount of heat that's generated uh, by the assembly of the body from a distribution of small particles and you add in the short-lived radioactivities, uranium, thorium, and potassium, you get a thermal history that looks like what you see on the left-hand side. These are cutaways of Iapetus, the moon Iapetus through time. This is the center, zero, and this is the um, uh, outer radius up here. This is 800 kilometers, a little larger than the, than the present value. I'll explain why in a moment. And this is time in millions of years. So uh, this is a logarithmic plot and uh, therefore you have to recognize that up until 10 to the 3, we've only gone about a billion years here, and then from 10 to the 3 out to this point is, uh, is uh, the present day right here. So the first 100 million years here are um, stretched out, if you will, uh, in a rather exaggerated way. So uh, the temperature scale is shown here, where blue is very cold and uh, light olive is... Um, is rather um, uh, warm. And actually the temperature scale did, did not turn out quite as vivid as it does on the computer screen, but it's, it's, it's legible. Um, accretional heating does very little for this body because it's small relative to objects that gain a lot of heat by accretion. So the dominant energy source here is actually 
the long-lived radioactivities. And as you imagine, they take a while to actually cook the satellite. Uh, it's really uh, not until you get out to about 10 to the 3 or 2 times 10 to the 3 in millions of years, that is 2 or 3 billion years, that one actually begins to heat a significant amount of the interior. And then as these uh, decay away, because they have half-lives that are, um, uh, the age of the solar system is significant relative to these half-lives, uh, the amount of heat that's produced begins to decline, and so the interior cools again. In this model, the interior never becomes dissipative enough or soft enough to slow the satellite from 17 hours to the present period of 79 days. <coughs> now, a number of things could be done. Uh, one could postulate um, a very, very large amount of porosity, very low conductivities, etc. cetera. Um, the difficulty with doing anything that puts in a lot of heat that is long-lived is that if you allow the heat to be sustained, you begin to melt a significant fraction of the satellite, and as it dissipates the spin, it also relaxes to um, a shape that's consistent with the present-day spin, spin. That is, it relaxes to a sphere from an oblate shape. The only way that it seems we can explain um, Iapetus is by including a short-lived radioactive source, that is something that provides a lot of power but over a short period of time. This effectively cooks the interior quickly, it heats the interior up quickly so that the interior becomes dissipative, but because the outer layers are actually made of water ice and not of rock, it takes some time for that heat to propagate through to the outer layers to soften them up to the point where the shape actually changes. And so in a sense, uh, the only solution that seems to work for Iapetus is to think of it as uh, what used to be called a Tootsie Pop, which is the lollipops that have the hard candy on the outside and the somewhat soft chocolate on the inside, okay? So you never try to chew the outside because it'll break your teeth, but once you get through to that chewy center, you can begin chewing. Uh, now, how do we do that? Well, the short-lived radioactivities, um, there are short-lived radioactivities that almost certainly existed in the early solar system. Aluminum-26 and iron-60 are the important ones. They have short half-lives, <coughs> uh, less than a million years, on the order of or less than a million years, a million for iron-60, uh, less than 100,000 years for aluminum-26. They're abundant enough that they can contribute, uh, can contribute enough energy uh, to actually heat the interior to the point where one gets a lot of internal dissipation while the outer portions of this body remain relatively uh, rigid. So on the right-hand side is a simulation where there is some fraction of short-lived radioactivities present in the interior from the beginning. Again, radius versus time. Now, to really make this model work, what Julie also had to do was to assume that the ice layers were rather porous, and uh, because of that porosity, as things heat up in the early epochs, remember this is out to a billion years, uh, the outer portions do get warm and the porosity decreases, but then they solidify again and stay rigid during the time that the satellite is still rotating rapidly. So the outer layers do get soft, but they get soft only early in the history of this satellite. The last three and a half billion years, uh, this body stays uh, relatively cold on the outside, but has quite a warm interior, and the dissipation during this time is sufficient to slow the satellite down to the present rate by tidal interaction with Saturn while maintaining an oblate shape. So the question then is, why do I say some short-lived radioactivities? If you take solar composition of the elements and you also take the predicted amount of, of radioactive aluminum and iron that would be present in the early solar system based on nucleosynthetic models, and you dump all of that into Iapetus, the heat is so intense that the entire satellite actually melts completely. Even though we're talking about two elements that are 
not the most abundant in the satellite, and we're talking about the radioactive isotopes of those elements. Nonetheless, the full complement of aluminum-26 and iron-60 that could be present, could have been present in Iapetus, had it formed very early in the history of the solar system, uh, are such that the satellite would be completely melted. What's required by this model is that only a fraction of the aluminum-26 and iron-60 that would have been present when the first solids formed in the solar system, the earliest meteorites and the earliest so-called calcium aluminum inclusions in meteorites were present. Um, that's too much. So we have to back away and ask ourselves how long after the formation of the first solids in the solar system, the calcium aluminum rich inclusions, would Iapetus have incorporated this solid material, would Iapetus have formed, in order to get the right amount of early heating. And this chart shows that. This is the heat provided from short-lived radioactivities in joules per kilogram. The gray area shows what we need to make the model um, uh, work. No, this actually, sorry, these are, the light gray area shows ranges of porosity that work. The dark gray area is the range uh, that we need to actually make the model work, the relationship between the time of formation and the heat provided. This has to cross the, um, the horizontal region where the acceptable porosities are to have a model that actually produces uh, both the right amount of tidal dissipation and maintain the shape of Iapetus. So the allowed area uh, here uh, between, this is really the, the, the decline in the amount of these radioactivities uh, and this then is, um, let me start again. I've confused myself even though I helped put this figure together. So this is the heat provided, this is the time of formation. The horizontal gray area is the allowed amount of heat that we can have uh, without melting Iapetus too much, softening it too much that would be above that region, or without having Iapetus too cold and rigid that it would not actually break or slow down sufficiently in its rotation. That's below that region. So the horizontal line is the allowed amount of heat provided from the short-lived radioactivities. Uh, and then this curve is the uh, actual relationship between the amount of heating versus time in the first six million years after the formation of the calcium aluminum rich inclusions. So where these two regions cross are the allowed models and the allowed age for Iapetus. Now it turns out that the amount of iron 60 relative to stable iron 56 uh, is not very well known. There's a, a range in the literature. Uh, the amount of aluminum 26 is better constrained. So that's why uh, there is, rather than a single line, a, a dark gray region here. So somewhere in this box from two and a half to five million years is the delay time that we need to wait before assembling Iapetus so that we get some short-lived radioactivities but not too much. Okay? Now in a second paper based on some revised uh, decay rates, we actually revised this to between three million years and about five million years, so we were able to tighten this up a bit. Now, Iapetus could not have formed before Saturn formed. Uh, it's in a circular orbit around Saturn. Uh, it is um, a regular satellite that almost certainly is a product of Saturn formation. The two bodies go together. And so this time scale for the formation of Iapetus we argue is the time scale for the formation of Saturn, namely between three and five million years. And if we put that on the plot I showed yesterday, which is this curve of uh, the uh, number of stars versus age that have an H alpha excess indicative of gaseous accretion, that is of a gaseous accretion disk, uh, of course this age is, is very comfortable, is perfectly compatible with the astronomical lifetime of disks uh, that um, come from the literature. Yes? Uh, if you wait long enough, you prevent Iapetus from melting completely, but if it's not molten in the beginning, how do you, do you get the oblate shape in the first place? Well, it is, okay, so this is why we need the porosity, okay? We need to actually, um, we need to have a situation where early on we get um, some significant amount of accretional heating. 
it, it is spun up, it's relatively soft, so it, it basically is like a rubble pile, okay? And so it, it acquires that oblate shape. And then the porosity goes away. The satellite basically anneals and becomes rigid uh, as it's being heated up in that early period of time. So uh, that's why the porosity is, is in the model, in order to basically make it a, a kind of a loose rubble pile that will have the hydrostatic shape of 17, uh, corresponding to 17 hours. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, um, this is one argument for the age of Saturn, okay? It's consistent with models of the formation of Saturn. For example, this one by Dodson Robinson and colleagues from a couple of years ago, uh, three and a half million years. It's not consistent with rapid migration on 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 year time scales. So one still has to address the question of how one avoids rapid migration of cores in the early solar system. Now there is evidence that Saturn and Jupiter both did migrate, and I'll talk about that uh, in this, uh, the second part of this presentation or lecture today, um, but they didn't migrate very much. So um, that's the argument that Saturn is uh, not 10,000 years old, not 10 million years old, but is between 3 and 5 million years old. Now, can we do this with other satellites? Well, unfortunately not, because first of all, you need a satellite that is large enough that these isotopes will generate a significant amount of heat and soften part of the interior. Uh, so the small satellites don't work. You need a satellite that's reasonably far out. Iapetus is basically way out here on the bottom plot. The satellites that are too close in experience much stronger tidal forces and they'll spin down even if they're quite cold. And then bodies that are too large like Titan and for that matter the Galilean moons of Jupiter um, are so massive and have such high pressures that they basically assume a hydrostatic shape. They're largely hydrostatic bodies even though they're solid. So Iapetus seems to be the sweet spot. Uh, Cassini has found no other strange shapes among all of these other objects in the Saturnian system. Uh, and so, of course, one would like to have a check on this idea, but for now at least it looks like Iapetus is it. Okay, so concluding that lecture then, um, at least in our own solar system, it seems that it took Saturn uh, between three and five million years to form. Presumably Jupiter took that amount of time as well. And that sets the stage for the next topic, which is the formation of terrestrial planets and the origin of the Earth's water. So I'm going to talk first about uh, the, motivate the question of the origin of water, talk about the basics of terrestrial planet formation, and um, try to put these together. And the conclusion is going to be that we really still don't know where water came from. Okay, so the basic problem with the origin of water on the Earth is that the Earth, if we look at this nebular cross-section again, the gaseous nebula, the hot inner nebula where uh, temperatures are quite high, above 500 Kelvin, perhaps 700 Kelvin, that's where the Earth formed. But if you want to bring in reasonably large amounts of water, you want to go out to where the water is. And the ice is out here at the snow line, there might be bound water inward of that, but certainly not at 700 Kelvin where dehydration of minerals typically occurs. And so there's a kind of a paradox that habitable planets sitting at one astronomical unit from the sun are not obvious locations for having planetesimals, the building blocks of these bodies that have large amounts of water in them. So where did the water come from? Well, there are several possibilities. The most popular and longest lived idea is that comets provided the Earth's water. They are rich in water, they are innumerable, uh, they are an obvious source. <clears throat> the second possibility is that there is, a, there is a way to trap water on grains in the one astronomical unit region uh, in a more stable fashion than we had previously thought before. And I'll talk briefly about that toward the end of the talk. That's the local water model. And finally, because comets, as I'm about to argue, may not be the best source of water, there's the idea that bodies in the asteroid belt uh, have enough water in them that they may be remnant samples of parent bodies, larger bodies, that somehow made it to where the Earth is today, 
collided with the earth and supplied water. And if someone has another source of water, raise your hand now, because these are the three that I'm going to talk about. First, let's talk about comets. These are, these are the things that have caused fear uh, for century upon century among the great kings of civilizations in the East and the West, and they really look like this. And I guess if one were actually heading right for us, we would be afraid. But these are spacecraft images. And uh, this is Temple 2 from Stardust. This is Hartley from Epoxy. Uh, Temple 2 is not very active and wasn't active at the time. Hartley is active. And I really have to say this actually looks like one of John's organisms uh, more than it does the nucleus of a comet. It's like a uh, is it? OK, fair enough. <clears throat> Maybe it's alive. So these are, uh, comet nuclei are anywhere from a kilometer to 40 kilometers in size. These are uh, in the 10 kilometer smaller range. Uh, what is contained within comets? Well, lots of stuff. Um, I'm using this slide, uh, I'll, I'll use it again when I talk about Enceladus. It's nice because it just shows you graphically if you focus on the gray, how much of these various constituents are in comets, CO2, methane, uh, ethane um, right here, uh, acetylene, uh, there's formaldehyde uh, present as well, uh, methanol over here, sorry, formaldehyde over here, and other organic compounds. And we'll compare them later to Enceladus. But comets are rich in these. Of course, these are relative to water. Comets are very, very rich in water. That goes without saying. Uh, in fact, in a, a, a table here, if you look at abundances, uh, water is at the top of the list among the non-rocky components. Uh, and comets are, you know, how much water, how much rock, it probably varies from nucleus to nucleus, but uh, the, all the evidence is at least consistent with the idea that comets reflect uh, the solar ratio of oxygen available to make water to silicon available to make rock. So why don't comets work as the source of the Earth's water? Well, there are two reasons they don't work. Um, <clears throat> one is that <clears throat> it seems really hard to get these bodies inward to where the Earth is in the presence of Jupiter. Now, comets almost certainly did not form in the Oort cloud, uh, which is just too far away from the sun, as well outside where the accretion disk was. They almost certainly formed uh, in the realm of the giant planets. And they were ejected, some of them, to the Oort cloud, which is this cloud of comets, 100,000 astronomical units, 100,000 times farther from the sun than the Earth is, uh, and as well into the Kuiper belt, which is the region beyond the orbit of, of Neptune, 30 AU and beyond. But in dynamical simulations uh, that were done by um, Alessandro Morbidelli and colleagues, including myself, and these have not um, been contradicted up till now, uh, comets are just very difficult to drive inward during the formation of the terrestrial planets in sufficient numbers to supply water on the Earth. Now, comets do get to the Earth, of course, uh, and that's why we see them. But they arrive at the Earth in the present day and over the history of the solar system in numbers that are just too small to supply the amount of water that we're talking about, which is um, at least... 0.02% of the mass of the Earth, but more likely 0.1% of the mass of the Earth, uh, if you account for not only water in the oceans, but also in the crust and the mantle, and water lost by impact. So to, this is a plot of one of our calculations, probability of comets impacting the Earth versus semi-major axis. Uh, there's a peak a couple of AU beyond Jupiter. This is what you need to get half an Earth ocean into the Earth, and it's just not enough. So dynamically, comets are a problem. Comets are also a problem chemically. The deuterium to hydrogen ratio on comets is simply much larger than it is for the terrestrial oceans. So here's a plot of the ratio of deuterium to hydrogen in uh, primitive meteorites, carbonaceous chondrites, and here's the number for long period comets. Standard mean ocean water, which is the deuterium to hydrogen ratio that you measure here uh, on the Earth, is shown uh, by this red arrow, 150 parts per million. Uh, the long period comets are twice that. And the analysis of bound water 
that's uh, been made now in the stardust samples coming from the refractory portions of comet Komi, uh, Komi are consistent with this number. Uh, so these are three long period comets measured uh, remotely and in one case Halley by mass spectrometry. Uh, but I have to emphasize that the stardust analyses where there's evidence of bound water, that D to H is also larger by a factor of roughly two than the standard mean ocean water. Chondrites, on the other hand, have a mean that fits very nicely around the terrestrial value. So let's focus on uh, meteorites then. Uh, chondrites are the meteorite general class, which uh, is the most primitive, appears to be samples of material that essentially condensed out, accreted, and survived uh, processing, did not get processed heavily or at all over the history of the solar system, and therefore contain a record of what rocky planetesimals look like during the time of formation of the Earth. Now, how much water do these bodies contain? Well, plotted here is the mass fraction of water uh, with a range for three, the three different main classes of chondrites, the enstatites, the ordinary, and the carbonaceous chondrites. Here's the Earth's water content that we want to match. These are arrayed according to the distance from the sun that the parent bodies for these meteorites are thought to have originated. It's a very, obviously, it's a theoretical number until a lot of asteroids are sampled directly, but this is a reasonable array, at least in terms of, of ordering of distance for these three classes. <clears throat> and then based on the fact that the Earth's moon is so dry, the impactor that hit the Earth to form the Earth's moon, which probably came from around the one astronomical unit region, not much farther out, uh, was probably very, very dry. So if you want to make Earth's water, it's got to be from ordinary chondrites or carbonaceous chondrites. And the question is, how do you get them to the Earth? Well, interestingly, the process by which terrestrial planets formed probably automatically delivers this material to the Earth. As I'll talk about in the next lecture, because I don't have time to put that in this lecture, um, there is a pretty good radioisotopic age for the formation of the Earth's core, which probably happened even before the Earth reached its present mass. And that time is 10 million years, possibly 20 or 30 million years, but certainly at least 10 million years. And that puts the formation of the Earth beyond the point at which the giant planets formed, Saturn and Jupiter, and therefore, importantly, the giant planets were in place when the terrestrial planets, at least in our solar system, formed. Now, that's good because um, the standard model of solid body formation, at least in the absence of gas, goes something like this. Uh, runaway accretion occurs on very short time scales. I talked about runaway yesterday briefly. It terminates when the separation uh, of these bodies exceeds the width of the feeding zones. At that point, there's another somewhat interesting process that is aided by the scattering of, of these objects uh, by the small gravitational perturbations um, uh, of the bigger bodies. And that's the so-called oligarchic growth. I talked about generating a situation where there tends to be one big body. Um, but in fact, there isn't just one, one big body, uh, as there is in terrestrial dictatorships. Uh, in the computer models, you tend to get several big bodies, an, an oligarchy, okay? Uh, and these are the ones that exist once the separation exceeds the width of the feeding zone. So in the literature, you'll find that terrestrial planet growth is really described as oligarchic growth because once you end the runaway accretion stage, there are actually a number of bodies of roughly equal size that tend to maintain that size. They tend to grow in lockstep the small bodies tend to shrink in number and importance just due to the fact that these larger bodies have bigger gravitational cross sections. The orbits of these, these bodies get big enough that now, uh, I'm not responsible for these terms, but they're in the literature and it's too late to change it. Once these bodies get to be the size of um, the Moon or Mars, uh, they, you tend to hear the term embryo used. Um, at about 10 to the 8 years, these bodies begin to cross uh, 
and they collide and coalesce to Earth-sized bodies in time scales of a few hundred million years, 10 to the 9 years on the outside. Um, now this time scale from the paper by Goldreich et al. is actually based on an analytic model in the absence of perturbations from an external body. And it's too long a time. Okay? The Earth did not take hundreds of millions of years to form. We know that because the Moon has rocks on it that date to within 100 million years or so of the formation of the first solid bodies in the solar system. So it was all over with in 100 million years. So the big challenge in terrestrial planet formation has been to try to accelerate this part of the process where these big bodies have cleared out material. They tend to sit on stable orbits and like all oligarchies do on the Earth, they've gotten fat and lazy and nothing much happens after that. So we need to push them and, and you know, speed them up. I see politics isn't a source of humor in here either, so I'll find something that's a source of humor. Hopefully not these lectures. All right, so what do we do? Um, well, the process evidently can be speeded up if there is a 300 Earth mass body that is sitting just on the periphery of this playing field of terrestrial planets, these hundreds or even thousands of lunar to Mars sized bodies, these oligarchs that are just sitting there waiting to be perturbed. And Jupiter is there, in fact, and is perturbing them through this process. And that tends to speed up the accretion. So the way this process is um, modeled, this is now a sort of a graphical depiction of this. This is uh, from dust to kilometer sized bodies to embryos to planets versus time. Uh, it's all got to be over with in 100 million years. The giant planets have formed probably just about here. So one wants to simulate the effect of the giant planets on the formation of the terrestrial bodies. And the way this is done is through um, uh, integrators called symplectic integrators. Uh, they integrate the ha Hamilton's equation of motion. Uh, they, they split the Hamiltonian into um, different, uh, basically a sum of Hamiltonians, each of which has a particular time scale. And being that, it's possible to handle uh, 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 very um, uh, uh, small perturbations that build up over a long period of time. It's possible to handle those well in a system where Keplerian rotation takes only years and the total accretion time takes 100 million years. So uh, these types of models were really pioneered by John Chambers. They're now widely available. They're widely used. The model that I'm about to show you, which is a movie, um, was uh, done by Sean Raymond and colleagues at the University of Washington and I'll explain what's going on in the movie uh, as it first starts out. So this is a time sequence of eccentricity versus semi-major axis of bodies whose mass is proportional to the area you see on the screen. The amount of water that these bodies have at any given time is given by the scale. This is the water mass fraction logarithmically. The, the Earth's oceans today are here. The Earth probably had to accrete with about this much, 10 to the minus 3, and the carbonaceous chondrites are, are somewhere out in here with a much larger amount of water. So what's happened, of course, is Jupiter is out at five astronomical units. It perturbed the bodies closest to it most quickly. They ended up with very large eccentricities, and those bodies began to infiltrate the inner part of the system and contribute water to the growing bodies there that initially uh, were uh, quite red. So we'll see that again. Okay, so the bodies here have very little water in them. These guys get perturbed to very large eccentricities. They're very water rich. Uh, and in this particular simulation that we did, we had a few hundred objects, but uh, now simulations are better by a factor of 10. Um, that damps out the eccentricities a little bit better than we were able to do. But you'll see that as time goes on, uh, these bodies get yellower and bluer and get more water. And that water is coming from the asteroid belt. So um, that process of building up bodies with Jupiter present both accelerates the rate at which this process occurs and provides water. And in fact, the time scales are just about right. The time to build up and Earth mass is something less than 100 million years in these types of simulations.
Um, the amount of water that is accreted depends very sensitively on uh, the eccentricity of Jupiter. Uh, these are three sets of models. Uh, each column is characterized by a different eccentricity of Jupiter. This is 0, 0.1, and 0.2. Uh, the highly eccentric Jupiter models produce very water-poor bodies in the inner part of the solar system because if Jupiter has a large eccentricity, it essentially plows into the outer part of the asteroid belt, gets rid of all that material very quickly, and there's no material left to actually come to the Earth. Now at the end of this lecture, I'll talk about a brand new model by Morbidelli's group that actually shows that that plowing effect may contribute water, but not from the asteroid belt, from cometary type bodies, from icy bodies further out. So anyway, this looks like it all works very, very well, but it has a problem. And the problem is that uh, although the Earth doesn't end up being largely a carbonaceous chondrite, it can have as much as f 5 or 10 percent carbon carbonaceous chondritic material in it. That is, 5 or 10 percent of the Earth uh, is a carbonaceous chondrite. Now, some but not all geochemists argue that this is inconsistent with other geochemical indicators about the Earth. Not the D to H ratio in water, but the oxygen isotopic ratios that one sees in rocks, uh, and also the distribution of a class of elements called siderophile elements uh, that are present in the mantle, um, <clears throat> and actually in the, uh, close to the core, in the core. Um, there's a very long, tortuous discussion about this, which uh, is, we need not go into here and there's not enough time to go into it here, but the bottom line is that some geochemists would allow 1%, others would say even that's too much. 1% of the carbonaceous chondrites doesn't quite get us enough water for the Earth. It gets us roughly the equivalent of an Earth ocean, um, but just barely. Okay, so um, one needs to then consider other material that may have been in the asteroid belt at the time, but is there no longer, or material that was a brief interloper in the asteroid belt. So those models were done back in the early 2000s. In the mid-2000s, 2005, 2006, a new class of bodies in the asteroid belt, represented by five objects, were discovered and classified and published by uh, Shea and Hewitt. And these are so-called main belt comets which are, um, three of them are shown here on a plot of orbit eccentricity versus semi-major axis. Here's the distribution of the asteroids with the famous Kirkwood gaps that we all learn about in general astronomy. And uh, Jupiter is out here at 5.2 AU. These are the Jupiter Trojans. These are the three comets, um, Reed, uh, Els, Pizarro, and I forget what the middle one's called. There are also two others now. Uh, these are bodies, centaurs and so on, that are on highly eccentric in, uh, intersecting orbits with the terrestrial planets, in this case Mars. Uh, we don't need to worry about those. But these are relatively low eccentricity bodies. They look like comets. They obviously have water and um, other volatiles in them. And they seem to be members of the asteroid belt. They come close enough to the sun with these eccentricities that they become active but their origin point, according to Shea and Jewett, is the asteroid belt. Now, if these are cometary bodies that resided in the outer part of the asteroid belt, then maybe we need to add another class of objects, and that's very, very interesting. The color scheme has been completely changed. This, up until I came downstairs, was purple. Uh, so this is a case where PowerPoint is telling me that this model is wrong and adjusting the water mixing ratio. That is truly bizarre. Okay, well this is supposed to be purple corresponding to this uh, and it's supposed to have the largest amount of water because it's basically cometary. And when you rerun the simulations, in some simulations, yes, you do get, um, if you assume there's enough main belt comet material, you do get a lot of the water from the main belt comet material. So possibly one has to think of uh, another class of meteorites, one of which we simply don't have in our collection of meteorites, which is represented by these five bodies that may in fact be members of the asteroid belt, but maybe not. Obviously more work needs to be done 
by the observational astronomers. Now, since all this work was done, there was a very big conference on the origin of water this last year, and a couple of interesting other ideas came up, one of which is the adsorption idea that I'll get to in a moment. But I want to first talk about this, because this is um, <clears throat> an idea that um, initiated with uh, Hansen at UCLA and was picked up by Morbidelli and Kevin Walsh and David O'Brien and colleagues uh, at Nice and, and um, uh, Boulder and Tucson. So um, this is a, a model in which Jupiter and Saturn actually migrate. Now the problem that they tried to address, or at least Hansen tried to address very briefly, is that in all the simulations that have been done so far, including the ones that I showed you with the, the movie, you don't really get our terrestrial planet system. Because at 1.5 astronomical units is not another Earth-sized body or quasi-Earth-sized body. Instead we have Mars, which is a tenth the mass of the Earth. And in almost all of these models, you don't get a Mars-sized body. Accretion is just too uh, efficient. Or you get small bodies on very high eccentricity orbits. In fact, up to this point, um, the only group that was able to get Mars-sized objects in their simulations uh, was the group in Kyoto, and they just added gas to sort of damp the eccentricities down. And then they ended up with a lot of Mars-sized objects. Um, but how do you make Mars? Well, what Hansen proposed in a paper a year or so ago in Astrophysical Journal was that if you could somehow arbitrarily shrink down the region of material uh, where these planetary embryos exist to something like between 0.7 and 2 astronomical units and assume that the asteroid belt is already dead, it's already a remnant that's been cleared, then in fact he gets Mars because he's truncated the amount of material that is out beyond Mars, okay? But if you truncate that material, how do you get water on the Earth from the asteroid belt? Because the asteroid belt's been depleted in his model. So along came Morbidelli and colleagues, and they said, well, look, suppose that Jupiter started migrating inward because there was still gas present, and as Jupiter grew, it suffered from the usual type one or type two migration. <clears throat> and in fact, um, in this model, not only does Jupiter migrate in, but, but stuff behind it gets dragged in with Jupiter, and it heads in toward the asteroid belt. Saturn actually kind of catches up with it and is in tow with it. This is now when the gas still exists, so it's three, five, seven million years after the, the, the disk began. And of course, what do Jupiter and Saturn do? They, they plow through the asteroid belt and they destroy it. And they get here to this point in the disk where they basically clear out uh, a big gap in the inner planet forming disk. And then a kind of a miracle occurs, um, which is that the gas begins to go away, uh, interactions with the particle disk occur as well, and the net result is not a miracle, but it's somewhat improbable because it all depends on timing, is that Jupiter and Saturn boomerang back outward. And we'll meet them again in the next lecture where they boomerang out to, which is not quite their present orbits, but it's close. So having destroyed the asteroid belt and cleared out the inner planet growth region, truncating it so that Hansen's model will work, they bounce back out. And in doing so, they send all this ice-rich debris into the asteroid belt in the inner solar system. And some of this material then collides with the Earth. And voila, we have water. Okay. Now, you should be very scared about this model if you want to believe that there are lots of habitable Earth-like worlds out there at one astronomical unit from their parent star that have water in them because this is very complicated choreography. So a lot of timing involved in this. I'll take, yes, go ahead. So what does boomerang mean? So it's like, like this. It's like by scattering some, some small... That's right. They scatter and then they come back out. Exactly. But the timing is that the disk has to go away right at that point. Now, it certainly does in our case. So maybe that works, but it, it, it argues for, uh, for the Earth being quite rare. Finally, and this is my last slide, the exactly opposite from a philosophical point of view model for the origin of water is the one offered by Mike Drake and colleagues. The most recent paper is by uh, Vatuone et al. Uh, 
And what they've done is laboratory experiments to show that under some conditions for some silicates, this particular lattice of silicon and magnesium being one, that water molecules will not simply adsorb, but they'll actually chemisorb on these silicate grains at 1 AU. And therefore, they will remain in those silicate grains at temperatures of 700 degrees Kelvin, where normally adsorption does not retain the water. So they propose that maybe the water for the Earth came from silicate grains at 1 AU that had the right properties to chemisorb the water. The problem here is it's still not clear yet that you get enough water. Now I want to make the point that in both the Morbidelli model and this model, the sources of water are nothing like what we have in our meteorite collections. That's okay, but it removes the question of geochemical constraints on those, on those carriers because they're material for which we don't have meteorite samples. And so while they may go a step forward in solving the water problem, they go a step backward in terms of not being able to apply the same geochemical constraints to the earth that is then formed from these objects that one could, assuming that the meteorite parent bodies were the carriers of the water. That's a sort of a technical objection and it may be it may be something that, that is unavoidable, but, but the fact is um, uh, that is the result. So the conclusions are that terrestrial planet formation certainly post-dated giant planet formation and Jupiter has played a role, either a very simple role as in the movie that I showed you or a very complicated choreographed role as in the Morbidelli et al. model. The source of Earth's water remains uncertain, but it may not be part of any meteorite collection. If it's some of these chemisorbed uh, water on grains, or if it's this, these icy bodies that are brought in uh, as Jupiter boomerangs back out, it's not material that we have samples of. In fact, if it's those icy bodies, you still have to address the question, what was the D to H ratio of those icy bodies? Okay? We, that's where we threw out comets in the first place. So was water local or was it imported? That is, do um, uh, Earth-sized worlds at 1 AU look more like the top figure, which is the Earth. Actually, it's not the Earth, it's Arizona, sorry. And the bottom one is uh, Mars. Does it look more like Arizona or does it look more like Mars? Which is more typical for an Earth at 1 AU? We still don't know. Thank you. Yes? Yeah, that's right. Okay, that's the, that's another Achilles heel for that model too. And, and in the boomerang model, uh, the bodies come from outside the solar system. And again, uh, no, not outside the solar system. They're they're the leftover icy bodies, uh, some of which will go to form the comets eventually. <laughs> but this is a, a set that gets that gets brought in. Um, by this particular withdrawal of Jupiter from, from the asteroid belt region. So it's part of the general icy bodies from the 5 to 30 astronomical unit region. But again, we have to assume that they have the correct geoengineering. Exactly. So that's it, yes. In these two models, we just ignore the geoengineering. Yeah, that's the problem with them. It's absolutely. Yes, Alain. Um, if the Earth had uh, 10 times less water, mm -hmm. life, would life be possible? Because if the ocean was still free, yeah, well, the first question, of course, is where would the water have gone? Would we have had oceans or would it all have ended up back in the, a, a kind of a hydrated crust of some kind? And if it did end up in the oceans uh, and the crust itself, of course, had relatively little water, then would we have plate tectonics? And without plate tectonics, would one be able to sustain this kind of stable, volatile recycling uh, the carbon silicate cycle that seems to be important for long-term habitability on the Earth. Uh, from the point of view, obviously, of, of just enough water to sustain organisms, of course there is enough, but the question is, where does it go? I mean, maybe you would have had organisms just living in the crust, just hydrogen feeding organisms. I'll start in the back, yeah. Right, so um, disks contain water vapor and the, the problem is then you have to trap it and bring it in to the earth. Uh, 
So the chemisorb grain model is one way to trap that material. The other way is to assume that much of that water does eventually make it into asteroids as water of hydration, uh, or even ice, but probably water of hydration, and comes in that way. Um, the fact that this is water in the inner, inner part, if that's relevant to the Earth, then it has to be adsorbed onto grains. But any of these nebular models predict there would be water vapor. It's just the water vapor is not the way you can get large amounts of water then into the Earth because it remains you know, with the hydrogen gas and gets swept away. It has to be condensed out. Uh, Jim. Yeah. Isn't one of the uncertainties in this how much water is inside the Earth today? Yeah, it's a huge uncertainty and also how much water was in there at the beginning, yeah. too. Because the, the, you know, the estimates that I've seen, there's maybe a half an ocean of water in the upper mantle mm -hmm. based on the, the mid-ocean rich basalts, which are pretty dry, but we don't really know how much is in the lower mantle and some yep. of the hydrogen may have gone into the core. Yeah, so Abe was uh, you know, a great proponent of a very water-rich Earth, I think. He was one of those that argued maybe a few times 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 2 even at the start, which would place a real strain on, on these models. And, and it would, it's very important to know what the mantle water is even today. You're looking at your watch. How many more